I heard what was said by Clancy. There, please. In the book. Craig. Craig? Craig? Is Craig? No. Are you John? It's so dark. No, it would be true. Jimmy? Oh, no, that, I know that. It was the book. Good morning. I don't know if it would be accurate to say that British Columbia is all agog today because the legislature opens in Victoria with Bill Bennett still on the face of it firmly in command. But we must keep you fully informed. And for that purpose, I have two experts this morning. One non-partisan, Harvey Oberfeld, my man in Victoria. And the second one, totally partisan, <laughs> Alec MacDonald, former Attorney General of the NDP administration and still a feisty, fighting supporter for the Social Democratic cause. Later in the program, you're going to meet a former Canadian ambassador to Bogota, Colombia, who might be able to tell us or explain to us some of this incredible hostage holding in South America. But first, the man with the pipe from Victoria, after the break. Okay, good enough. We don't want it to look on you. <clears throat> Harvey Oberfeld is our man in Victoria. He's the man who keeps his uh, fingers on the pulse of government and will tell us precisely and accurately what is in the throne speech about to be presented to the House this afternoon. Is that possible, Harvey? No, it's not possible, Jack. Uh, I have it here. It was released to the press this morning at 8 o'clock, but as you know, it's embargoed until the Lieutenant Governor begins to speak in the House, and uh, I'm sworn to secrecy I can't reveal the contents just yet. But, Cheerio, uh, Harvey. <laughs> Listen, if you've got that throne speech there, you can't even predict what's in the speech or you and I will be accused of a leak, so you've muzzled me. Well, we haven't. We can talk about the closing speech yesterday. That was quite interesting. It, uh, it shows the government has a sense of humor. Uh, they presented uh, the lieutenant governor with this small closing speech to read, and it was really quite amusing to see him reading this speech, praising the government for everything that it has done in the last session and talking about the sound economic policies of the government. And it was really hard to, for the MLAs to keep a straight face knowing that the government had written this speech that Bell Irving, Henry Bell Irving, was reading and uh, praising the accomplishments of the social credit government in the last session. Uh, but isn't that routine normal? Don't all governments pat themselves on the back on every possible occasion? I think true so. or false? Oh, absolutely. And uh, the, the funny thing is that, of course, they surround it with pomp and ceremony to sort of give it a certain sense of legitimacy. But we all know it's politics right down to the core. And uh, uh, we're, we're waiting for it when it comes, uh, 
we're more amused than surprised to see it. Well, just a minute. I've still got a couple of... Well, give me one phrase that's going to make me laugh, will you, please? Well, for instance, in starting off, uh, Henry Bell Irving said he is grateful that legislation had been enacted which, due to the sound economic policies of his government, had brought fiscal relief to the people of the province. Well... What uh, is fiscal relief? Well, fiscal... You mean taxes went down? Well, apparently. Uh, of course, the sales tax went down before the election. Uh, it was a promise, and uh, there are things like that. There are, he mentioned brick. He mentioned a few of the other things that the government has done. But uh, really, everybody was kind of fidgeting yesterday because yesterday was the first ceremony. Today is the second ceremony. Today, people are waiting to see what the government is going to promise now to you'll, do. Now you'll be telling me that a titter ran through the gallery yesterday afternoon. Well, there was more than a titter. I think everybody was kind of uh, really quite amused at this speech. Are we using a live feed from the legislature for this? Let's go down to business. Yes, we are. You've got to compliment Bennett in a sharp, shrewd, crafty, clever, open political move in picking up the NDP idea for a moratorium on uranium mining and exploration. Well, the timing of that, sp that statement was very surprising. Uh, he really surprised quite a few people in the press gallery. Uh, nobody really had an idea that was coming. Of course, you have to remember there was a massive demonstration scheduled today for Victoria for the opening of the legislature from people opposed to uranium mining. And really, the premier nipped that in the bud. He took away the uh, publicity that those people would have received. And also, uh, we know that the opposition would have called for that moratorium in the House as they have in the past. And if Bennett responded after the House was in session, it would look like he was caving into the opposition. So he did a very smart political move. He came out. He announced it. He perhaps, some people say, he uh, certainly uh, saved some of the embarrassment he would have in his own writing where there's quite a few people concerned about uranium mining. And uh, basically, he stole the show from the opposition. Listen, you've seen the reaction from the mining industry. They are not at all happy about the loss of millions of dollars in revenue. Well, the thing to remember, of course, is that this is an ordering council. It was not legislation. Uh, the, the well, what about the bill, then? Wasn't, uh, didn't Barrett say he was going to introduce a private member's bill? Well, Barrett said he'll introduce a private member's bill, but a private member's bill has almost no chance of being passed in the legislature, Will there especially be a if it's introduced by the opposition. I can guarantee it won't be passed. Mm -hmm. But uh, Bennett, uh, really what he's done is he's done, by doing it through ordering council, he, uh, the cabinet next week could change its mind. I mean, he said seven years, but there's nothing really to hold him to that promise. Uh, if three or four years down the road, let's say after another election, if he's returned and he wants to change that policy, he could do it uh, just simply through a cabinet meeting. Listen, did yesterday's uh, praiseworthy throne speech uh, make any mention of doity tricks? Uh, no, the uh, lieutenant governor seemed to run out of time before he got around to those, uh, <laughs> is that those one, areas. Is that going to be the big thing this session, yes or no? Uh, the opposition says no, but I think it's going to be uh, pretty important. The opposition says no. The opposition says that they're going to concentrate on unemployment, on uh, economic growth. Oh, we'll get that from Alex. Yeah, but I think I think you'll see uh, Donald. You'll see some more uh, coming out on dirty tricks in the next uh, little while. You've got none up your sleeve, I trust. You better keep that thing embargoed until when? Until uh, uh, he starts to speak today, about 2.15, and then we'll have it all on tonight's news. Did you ever get your picture taken to put on your chest as required by one of the people in the Premier's office so that you can be instantly recognized by civil servants around the place? No, somehow, uh, since the publicity arose over that, they seem to have forgotten the plan and the proposal, and uh, it's gone by the boards, and I don't think we'll hear, be hearing about that again for quite a while. Yeah, I'm sorry to tell you that I might be joining you there, you know, depending on things going, Victoria. I might do some live broadcasts uh, from your little seat there in the next couple of weeks, a couple of months. Well, it would be very nice to have somebody else over here taking some of the heat that I've been taking, so you're welcome anytime. If you just stop smoking that repulsive pipe. Uh, well, I'll keep it in my mouth, but I won't light it when you're here. Thanks, Harvey. Oberfeld, isn't it? Yeah, that's the way it's spelled. Thanks, Harvey. Next, right. time, next guest is Alex McDonald of the NDP, after the break.
Yeah, I know it'll. The people will think the bu seconds. building's on fire. All the girls will leave. Ali McDonald, known for many years in his political capacity, former Attorney General in the NDP government. Uh, you're not deputy leader or anything, are you? Oh, no, no, no. Who is? I'm a, just a critic for the AG. Critic for the Attorney General's department? That's right. Well, you should certainly know because you were well criticized when you were AG. I sure was, including by you. And I have you another... Know, that's, that helps to, make, the, uh, helps to do, make you do a good job. Oh. You winced when I called you partisan. Are you now at the stage, Alec McDonald? What is your age, I'm by a, the way? Oh, do I have to reveal yes, that? Yes, you must. Well, I have the body of two 30-year-old men. And the mind of one 60-year-old. <laughs> well, you, you are now 60. You can add, eh, Jack? You are now oh, 60. Yeah. You winced when I... Well, I, I went to your 60th birthday party, so you... I trust... So don't uh, start uh, being derogatory. I trust that I'm at your 70th birthday <laughs> party. Now, look, Ali, let's get down to business. Okay. You winced when I said partisan, and I think you, that you were a partisan person, and I think you meant that wince. Oh, I just partly meant it, Jack. Of course, I'm a member of a party, but as you, you know, as you get a little, a little more experience and uh, get a little older in life, you're not quite as partisan in a party sense as you once were. Mm -hmm. You're more willing to accept the good done by the government in power or the opposition of the day. Yeah, and sometimes uh, I'm not too happy with everything that your own party does. But mind you, I think that makes for a stronger party to have different points of view within it. Are you prepared to compliment openly and on camera the bold action of Premier Bennett in scrapping the Bates Commission and ordering counselling a seven-year moratorium on mining and exploration in British Columbia? Speaking personally, I am not prepared to compliment Premier Bennett. He canceled an inquiry under Dr. David Bates and one other guy I know, uh, Murray, he's from UBC and a very capable geologist, eh? Before they had finished their work. Now, if you want to put the moratorium on the mining, I'm talking personally, I'm not uh, talking any particular party line, I'm not sure what it will be. But uh, to cancel an inquiry that's trying to bring out the facts on something, whether it's uranium or uh, whatever, or, and there are many other things, you know, asbestos mining and uh, the grain elevators, you get emphysema there, and so dangerous stuff, and life is dangerous. But I don't think you should cancel an inquiry midstream and waste two million bucks. You should let them finish that and lay the facts before the public. Well, as an elder statesman of the New Democratic Party, <laughs> would you please interpret for me why Mr. Bennett did it at this time and at the same time canceled the Bates Commission? Purely political. He has had, legitimately, in my opinion, an awful lot of, of trouble, political trouble, because of what is called lettergate and dirty tricks. He therefore looks for motherhood announcements, you know, a bridge over Anasis and the BC Place, and they're not well prepared and so forth. And here is another motherhood announcement, a good headline and that takes attention away from these other things which should be explored. And that's my, I think it's just a political move. In any case, he should have waited, you say, until the Bates Commission recommendations, and then he could have made his arbitrary decision at that time. Yeah, I think so. You know, it, our party believes that in the meantime, the, the exploration and the mining of uranium should be, should be wait also until it, that report does comes not, in and there's a proper debate. Does this action by Premier Bennett not indicate to you that he is, in fact, not a right-wing free enterpriser, but a populist? who will take the popular moves and do whatever is necessary to retain the favor of the majority of the people at the votes. I think so. I think he's just behaving politically at the present time. Would you be building an Anasis Island crossing? No. Would you be building, what's that new one down in False Creek? The BC Place? The BC Place. Well, if they, you know, if the plans come along nicely, sure. But I just don't think it's been well prepared at this stage. Would you be spending half a billion dollars on the new route through the Coquihalla? A highway? Mm. You mean the highway through there? Yes. No, the first priority should be transit and rail if we're going to save ourselves from the Arabs and from the air pollution and get rid of the congestion in our cities and have a cleaner environment. Just a minute. You said first priority, sh priority should be transit and rail, quote, if we're going to save ourselves from the Arabs. Yeah, we're bleeding to I'm death financially. I'm, I'm talking about the Western world, eh? We're going to bleed ourselves to death financially and weaken the whole Western world because of our dependence upon foreign oil. Not just Arab oil, but foreign oil. What's that got to do with Arab oil? 
Transit has a heck of a lot to do with it. If we electrify, if you know, if we have rapid transit with electricity, which we can produce in abundance in this province, we're saving, uh, among other things, not only the environment but foreign exchange, and that's important for Canada. I suppose so. It certainly yes, of is. course. I'm beginning well, to, yeah. The penny's beginning you know, we're to not drop. Not it's so seldom that a provincial politician drops in the word Arab that I was quite <laughs> shattered. Well, we're importing 300,000 barrels of oil a day now. It's going to go up to about 800,000, and the price is now 30, and it's going up to 40, and so forth. That's a real major hemorrhaging off Canada. Mm -hmm. And we've got to do something about it if you're going to save the Western world and what we believe a, is a free society. Yeah, well, of course, you must admit the nation's in a parlous state as well. As, uh, you would probably say the province is in a parlous state, but so is this nation. No, I've, I'm optimistic, though, Jay. But, uh, you know, I think we've got to do hard things. Mm -hmm. What kind of hard things? Well, that's, that's, an, that's one example. And the other thing is we've got to... Uh, well, I think we have to plan our economy. I could, I could make a socialist speech, but I, th and I think we've got to get back to, to thinking in terms of productivity and the production of wealth, just as much as we think about the spending of it. Well, you're entitled to be cock a hoop now, picking up these extra seats in the federal election. Twelve NDP and sixteen Tories, and not a single Liberal. You've done all the constitutional conferences. Just, I've got some other questions for you. But just before we go to the break, what do you think of all this garbage? that Volpe and Perot and Axworthy and company are talking about special representation for the West. And even your little man Waddle in the House of Commons is saying, have a special committee for the West. Give me an honest answer. The system works pretty well. We didn't elect any liberals in the West, eh, to the House of Commons. All right. Does that mean we're not going to be governed and uh, considered? I would think we are. Putting uh, Perot into the cabinet is not, in my opinion, going to help the West particularly. He was in the cabinet before. Elect, yeah, I know, and it didn't, I didn't see any difference except that uh, through the, the patronage, you know, the appointment of judges, then you got somebody to uh, speak to about it. But um, let democracy sort itself out. It's doing pretty well. Let's not have the Senate and that kind of thing. Like Non-elected people put in the cabinet. That's bad. As former attorney general, you shouldn't have mentioned judges. We might just do touch on that little delicate topic too uh, with other things there are no delicate topics no delicate topics. none any question Let i like him, no that's right you're prepared to be sued do you not so believe it do you not believe in an open society i Jack? certainly do all right there but are no are, delicate subjects the attorney general's department not under your day certainly didn't protect the public interest in a couple of noticeable notorious ju judicial affairs okay you're, you're asking after, me a question I'm or asking, after the break? After the break. All right. I have good reason to believe, from my own sources, that there will be an amendment, an amendment to the Provincial Judicial Council Act. Mm -hmm. When you were in power, you could have amended that act to give it some teeth to prevent a repetition of the re reprehensible state of affairs witnessed in Vancouver over a provincial court judge. How tough should that act be? Well, I agree it should be toughened up. I mean, I, you know, what, what I did was to create the uh, new judicial council so that I could not, as attorney general, make appointments of judges until they had come through with a recommendation of that council. So I tried to take politics out of the appointment. In terms of its sort of administrative jurisdiction over the judges who occasionally need it, it is not as strong as it should be. All right, this is the very point. You, and this is our end thing, and I'm going to do it like it a lumpet on the air. 
When a judge runs into trouble and admits culpability in certain public behavior, which is quite unacceptable, both to the layman and presumably to the legal profession and the Attorney General Department, who is it that, re that could remove a judge, provincial judge, from office? Well, to begin with, it can't be the politician, eh? That's the Attorney General. You cannot have politics being able to fire a judge. Otherwise, they That's have no the, security, no tenure. No. And if you don't like the political face, you could fix them. Yeah, and the, their decisions will be influenced by the fact that a politician can fire them out of their job. So the politics has to be out of it. Therefore, you must have a, this, this judicial council, eh? And they should be able to look at two kinds of cases, not just one, uh, where, where conduct warrants leaving the bench or suspension, and secondly, where somebody is not giving value back to the public in terms of their work. You load. mean incompetence? No, I'm not, not talking, well, possibly, but I'm not talking, no, that's dangerous because who's, you know, you can say a judge is incompetent because you don't agree with his decision. That's, no, I'm saying dogging it. What some, is, what there, are dogging? there are some who do not put in a full day's work in return for their, and uh, I'm not talking about the higher courts, they're working pretty We're hard. We're talking about the provincial happens, court. Occasionally it happens in the provincial court and nothing can be done about it. Nothing is done, particularly. What, what powers should be given to the Provincial Judicial Council to keep it, as you idealistically hope, away from capital P politics? Well, they, they, they should have a strength in powers, and I, and I believe they should hold uh, to the hearings. Should the hearings be open? I suppose, yes. they, I suppose they should. Must be open well, I think on a serious yeah, charge. Right. Yes, I think so. And uh, I think that there should be that kind of supervision. Mind you, I think there should be for lawyers and the disciplinary hearings of the benchers, they should be open and there should be a public watchdog there too. And I think in the College of Physicians and Surgeons and the Dentist, there should be a public watchdog. Why didn't you do it when you were attorney general? Because we did too much. And people like you went on the radio and said that we were doing too much. And we never got around to a whole bunch of things. So now we're going to have to go back and do them in our next term in office. These are the easy things hey? to do. Yeah, I, they were easy. I can think of the troubles that I helped you to get into I on know. the Land Act, for instance. Oh, we had fun there. And on your Emergency you Civil know, Defense you, Act. That day you gave me such... Dickens. Remember the first one came in, that little thing about this long, and you gave me the Dickens about it, and I went back and spent the three hardest weeks of work in my life in redrafting it, and now and it turned out to be one of the finest oh, yeah. codes in North America, with I, help. I remember my question, <laughs> which rather stumped you, and we were doing it out of a little hotel room in Victoria. I in said, Victoria. where are the provisions for the appeal? And, and you I, said, well, now come to think of it. We better go back to the drawing board. <laughs> no, but quite yeah, seriously on the too. judges. Yeah. No, okay. on the other thing, right. this is not. It is germane. The number of complaints I still get about the legal profession and the dental profession, not so much the medical profession, are legion. They really are. And I see no reason why, mm -hmm. neither, why either you or Social Credit couldn't simply the, uh, open up these acts and say, we will put on their ruling committee two members of the public who will act as watchdogs mm -hmm. and submit, let them submit their report to the legislature for publication. I agree. You know, I think that kind of thing is more important than a provincial ombudsman overlooking everything. Put them on in specialized areas, have an ombudsman out at UBC to make sure that the student's interest is not being abused and they're being let down and not getting a proper d job done by their higher-ups for them. Right. Things like that. Now, just one other thing I'd like to say, though. You, is your off-camera life, if you misconduct yourself, is that something that should affect your job? My answer, sir? You're asking me? Yeah. Yes. It it's, should affect your job. Why? Well, once you take a position as a judge, you are, uh, you are in a different capacity, and you must realize... Different from yourself, say. Of course. Why, well... Let's not be too much and be, be a little careful on that. These point, people you know? are secure for life. They take away the liberty of other people when they have to in a proper mm -hmm. manner. And they must adopt higher codes of moral and uh, public higher. conduct than the individual. Okay, higher. But you've got to respect somebody who's put in their week's work, eh? And then in their after hours, should they be treated very much differently from their ordinary fellow citizens? I, you've got to be careful. They cannot be involved in public scandal of any time, any kind. Neither can you, for that matter. Neither can I, for different reasons. But they are obligated not Well, to. I used to fight cases for labor, eh? 
that when the guy's finished his eight-hour shift and he goes home, that the employer can't fire him for that, what he does at night. Oh, no, of course not. It's not job-related. That's freedom. And you won't grant any of that in favor of judges or MLAs or anything like that, eh? None of that principle? I said public scandal. Okay. Not Pub private public scandal. Public scandal, yeah. Well, whatever the, I don't know what the difference is. Oh, come now, Mr. Do you I You mean when the one, one hits the newspapers, it's public. If it doesn't, it's... Uh, if it hits the public and becomes a, 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 a festering scandal in public. Mm -hmm. As you and I both know, there have been a number of such things, and I'm not referring to anything special, where we've all been concerned and nothing has been done. Yeah. Mind you, the, the judge's job is, in many cases, full of tension and difficulty. And in many cases, they're watching really troublesome cases and deciding on them, coming at them day after day. Mr. McDonald. More than you, because... Because I can't send people to jail. Well, most of them, but not too well, you know, if there are cases, if some go to jail. I'm going to be few. quite specific, you know, in a general way. <laughs> specific in a general way. Um, yeah, I okay, mean, go ahead. I mean, there aren't people like you All so right. much that I begin to get fuzzy-minded on occasion. Okay. You cannot have an alcoholic dealing with people from the bench in, for instance, the case of drunken driving. That's right. Can't be there. And if that particular illness is present in a judge, and I it call it an go. illness, well, it, it, no, there, he should either go to AA or, or treatment or go. But you, it's not incurable. It's an illness. We're agreed. If it, you know, if it isn't cured, that's different. I, then I think he should resign. The code of she, conduct for judges should be tightened up. They have a code of conduct, you know. Mm -hmm. I think. <laughs> Is it official or informal? <laughs> Alec MacDonald and Webster, after the break. I have to face the old guy. <laughs> <laughs> We're on the air, you know. <laughs> You're not showing proper respect. <laughs> they keep telling me to swing my chair around and look right at you. And you said just now you've got to fit, turn around to face <laughs> the old guy. Oh, did I say that? That was off camera. That is to coin a phrase. <laughs> you were not off camera. That is to coin a phrase, a dirty trick. <laughs> what reaction do I get from you on the use of that phrase? This is really a, an ink, a Rorschach ink blot test. <laughs> okay. I will now say the word again and again and again. Dirty tricks. What does that mean to you, Alec MacDonald, for this, this session of the legislature? It means uh, dogs uh, dropping things in parks and somebody going with a sc some kind of a long cane and a scoop thing that having to clean it up. It also means uh, sort of an attitude toward politics that we've got in Victoria. And I'm not, uh, I don't treat it lightly. I really think that uh, the thing that, didn't, just n the letter writing and signing the names and stuff is only part of it. The worst of the whole thing was the, was the gerrymandering. That was raw. And, you know, if you do that, you're going to you destroy democracy. We have not yet got the Prolupton Report. You know about the Prolupton Report. Is it, no, is it yeah, Prolupton. Uh, Prolupton. He's a lawyer yeah, appointed yeah, Norm, by the yeah. Attorney General's Department yeah, Norm, to Prolupton. do an inquiry into the uh, ECAP Commission, basically, that's what it is. We haven't that's got right. yet that report. So therefore, you will not be able to ask questions about that in the floor of the House, will you? Oh, yes, it's nothing, uh, there's no official, uh, but uh, there's no official inquiry. You know, Norm Perlipson of the AG's department, I understand he's doing a fairly thorough job and that he's interviewing people. For uh, hour after hour after yes, hour. Yes, and it's on, uh, you know, recorded. That's what I understand. And I just, uh, I just hope that Alan Williams has the courage, as he must as Attorney General, to reveal the report. Would you have done so? Yes, I think you've got no choice in that case but to let it hang out. Have you not got praise for, Alec for Alan Williams, your brother-in-law, in law, not related, <laughs> for the remarks he chose to use when he released the earlier report on Lettergate? They were the RCMP words, cowardly and reprehensible, which th he repeated. Oh, I thought they were his words. No, they came through from the RCMP report. And he should release the report, but uh, yes. Yes, I have some praise for that. I haven't got praise in another matter where a, a charge was not laid, and I don't think it was properly handled. You're talking about the Ritchie affair. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you know, we, it, I can't think of anything bold that you ever did in that field, because we're always told you can't get police reports. 
right back to the Butler Report. Do you remember the Butler Report? Of course, way many that years was on ago Summers. And, and when, the I, Summers when I became Attorney General, I asked, I said, send me that report. And it was everything I thought it... Uh, you didn't release it either. Well, I, in, what, in 19 at that time? I don't know whether I did or not. Did Are I you not telling me... It? No, you didn't. Well, no, but there was no call for it. The thing had happened no, you 20 didn't. years before, and the no, guy you had didn't served question his time. Mark. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't testify I on that. I didn't try and make anything secret about it. Yeah, you're telling me that when, a when an attorney general causes an investigation to be made which touches on politics or ethics in the handling of government or party affairs, those reports should be made public in toto, in full. Yeah, when he's asked for it, you know, like in the, in the Ritchie case and in the, in the Lettergate case, the attorney general, as the head of the law justice, has asked for a report. The report comes in, and then he doesn't let the public see it. No, I don't think that's but right. But you know perfectly well, Mr. McDonald, that police reports sometimes contain secondhand allegations, hearsay, uh, well, lack well, of... I'm sure, yeah, but I'm sure that the RCMP officers wouldn't, uh, wouldn't have that kind of thing. And I think they would, and their recommendation and their basic facts and what people have said about it, I think that should be laid out. What therefore, and it's no secret, will you be asking the Attorney General to do in the current crises which you perceive because of the heat and burden of the day being carried by television, BC television, and the newspapers. What will you be asking for this session? The Attorney General has to play it absolutely four square. He is not responsible to his cabinet colleagues in his role as Attorney General. If a charge has to be laid, if information of ethical malpractice is there, he must reveal it. I don't know whether he will or not. I don't, don't think he did in the Ritchie case. I, I was disappointed about that. Disappointed in the Ritchie case. You'll yeah. be attacking the government on the letter gate, and you'll be attacking the government, or you'll be asking the government for more information on the Eckhart report. Oh, yes. Yeah. Look, this is another esoteric thing. Is it, would it not be much better, even in a small government like British Columbia, if the Attorney General were outside the cabinet altogether? Was, was, was not as such a member of the cabinet. Oh, I think he can wear those two hats. You know, in terms of the administration of justice, he, even if cabinet votes not that a charge should not be laid, he has to make his own decision because it's a judicial decision. But I think he should be tied into the political process. He's also kind of a watchdog who should be looking over and being part of the, what's happening within that government so that it's, it's running in, a, in an ethical way. No, I think the, I think that kind of British system of him being in the in the same cabinet is good. He shouldn't be isolated. A policeman standing on the outside. No. Um, I wonder if you answer this question, it may tend to show your hand. But do, does the NDP plan any special tactics in view of the fact that you have kept a very low profile on all the allegations of political mismanagement, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, ad nauseam against the government? Have you any special plan of campaign for the session? That's being formulated, eh? We've met in, in caucus for the last uh, two days in Victoria. We're meeting again. We're going to listen to the speech from the throne, and uh, the final plans will be at a caucus meeting, I would think, on Monday. Oh, fair enough. Uh, Denticare, of course, w will be in the speech from the throne this year, won't it? They've promised it before. You promised but it, too. Did we, we never put it in the speech from the throne, did we? No, no, no I don't think so. I think what we felt we should... What uh, Dennis Koch was doing was moving toward the preventive thing and the treatment of children's teeth and starting there, including, you know, paradental personnel and so forth, so we keep the costs under control and moving it, then gradually extending that to the whole population. That's the way to go. A couple of other things, and I want to get calls to you, Alec, okay. this morning. Okay, whatever you say. Yes, yeah, whatever I say, calls. And a couple of things from me to Alec McDonald. I don't like people who call you Alex. Alec McDonald after the break. Are you convinced, Alec McDonald, that the social credit have made such a botch of it that it's just a question of keeping a low profile now for all of you and walking into office in the next election three no. years down the no, road? Of course, eh? No, of course not. Electors have a no. short memory, don't they? Yes. Uh, well, we do too, but I, uh, no, I think, there are, I think they're in very serious political trouble. 
I think the trouble centers around the Premier. I think they may have a reshuffling. You know, he'll resist it, but uh, that uh, would save them, in yes. my opinion, and give them a fighting chance at the next election. What do you mean by that remark? They may have a reshuffle which would save social credit and give them a fighting chance at the next election, Mr. They McCarthy. might have a palace revolution in which they deposed the king and chose another leader. Are you suggesting that uh, unhappiness among social credit caucus is so strong that Bennett might be asked to step down? Among their supporters, out, uh, you know, the caucus are very dependent. They've almost all, there are only seven privates left. They've almost all been given little jobs of one kind or another. Somebody's a deputy speaker, somebody's doing this, somebody's chairing a committee and so forth. They're kind of dependents off the king, his retainers. So maybe there's not too much of a revolt there. But outside, in the terms of those people who traditionally support social credit, there is great unhappiness with what is happening at the top of this government. Well, the, the, this move for a palace revolt could not happen during the coming session. Oh, it could. Sure. You know, I, f I think quite frankly that if Alan Williams does his job with complete integrity, that uh, Bennett will have to go. I must ask you to explain that. If Alan Williams does his job with complete integrity, Bennett will have to go. I would think so. What does that mean, Mr. Because I think there is real substance to the unethical practices that have taken place in Victoria and, uh, and including the gerrymandering thing. And uh, that's my... You know. Ali McDonald says he believes there is real substance to the unethical practices which have taken place mm -hmm. in Victoria. Yeah. Okay, Alec, we'll leave it at that. And we'll go to telephones. Okay. This is your camera, Alec, number two, if you're answering a telephone okay. call. Look into the center of it. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Oh, good morning, Mr. Webster. I'd like to uh, pose a question to Mr. McDonald. Yes. And uh, that is, uh, you said that uh, rapid transit and rail as opposed to a new bridge, eh? Mm-hmm. Also our support of the Arab addiction oil of 300,000 barrels a day, eh? Mm -hmm. I, for once, and speak for thousands, of having to burn gallons of gas waiting in lines of traffic to get to our jobs from the south side of the river. Right. And if you solve that problem, you are in a big cons in a, into conservation like crazy, eh? And I, I fully agree with that, eh? Like this new bridge. Mm -hmm. and also, another question I'd like to ask you is how did you get to BC Television today? Did you drive or did you take a bus? I am a sinner. I drive a little Pinto. It's not the biggest car in the world, but I. But, but I have never, you know, even when I travel it throughout the province, I've, I go by car because we don't have rail service. And I'd, I, there would be times, but only times, when I would use rapid transit if it was here, to go out to Surrey or go to Wally or something, and then somebody so picks me up at the station. If you had to get to BC Television leaving from Newton this morning at 7 o'clock in the morning, you would yeah. have realized the traffic problems that we do have on the south side of this yeah. river. When I say no bridge, I'm not thinking in terms of, the, you know, I think the GVRD's proposal to upgrade and have a new crossing at, by the Patello Bridge and have the re light rapid rail on it so the rail can fan out through Surrey and Delta, I think that's a good plan. And in it, that would also help traffic, but it would also allow the rails to pass Thank through. you. A good point. Go ahead, please. Yeah, Mr. McDonald. Yes. As I recall, uh, the years of your administration and the downtown scene uh, through 72 and 75, I have to note that there was a lot of the uh, hippie culture from all over Canada floating around the downtown area, which, they've, which the Barrett government was putting up uh, freebie in youth hostels and uh, handing out uh, freebie welfare checks to at our expense. And also, while you were there as the Attorney General, what did you ever do for the people of this province, sir, with respect to cleaning up the downtown uh, flesh markets and, and the drug trade in the, in the uh, city sin strip, other than closing your eyes and pretending it just didn't exist, that it, it, it isn't happening? Gee whiz, I think that I'd have to put that guy down as doubtful in terms sir. of being a supporter. What do we do? Uh, that's a big question. What do we do about the drug trade? We started CLUE, eh? the Coordinated Law Enforcement Unit, and we made progress in drying up the supply. Only progress, no abs, but not bad. Now, in terms of the other things, you say we were giving welfare to hippies and so forth. You'll have to prove your point. I don't know if any... There, there may be cases today for... 
where people are not allowed to starve. But I'll tell there's one good there's one good thing. Let me forget about the question. There's one good thing that has happened. You know, the young people of today are, are in a better frame of mind and a better lifestyle than they were ten years ago, Jack. Oh, I believe in my that. Opinion. Don't it's you agree? The, it's the pendulum. Yeah. It's the pendulum. That's what I think it is. So. Yeah. However, you made a good call. I, do you presume, as I do, that the mayor, the new minister of health, is going to have to junk totally his compulsory or so-called Brannan Lake uh, heroin treatment no, program? No, it's just an awful waste. Of, it's not working. You don't want to take the drug guys and then throw them together in one place and have them talk at drugs all day and all night and wait, just waiting to, get, to use the needle again. And, uh, oh, God. You don't do that. That's no way to treat them. Well, I've got my own views on what they could have done and should have done, but now it's at the end of the road. They might as well scrap it. Oh, they have to, yeah. They have to. I agree on there that. Are, there are young people who need can be helped before they get really addicted. Go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, Mr. McDonald. Yes. Uh, phone in regards to uh, a thing, uh, in regards to the court system. Yes. Uh, I've got two young children, one and a half and three years old, that are in care of MHR. Okay, and it's taken me six months to get a hearing in front of a Supreme Court judge, to, uh, oh. you know, just to uh, know. You know, find out what's happening with the kids and to get them out of care. I know. Okay, I was wondering why it, it, it takes six months to get a hearing. Well, the Family Relations Act, uh, and I admit it's a difficult area that the SOCREDS passed has been shot full of holes by the Supreme Court, and whole sections have been declared invalid and the family courts are not really working. Therefore, you have to go to the high courts with a custody case today. Right, but and it's most unfortunate because their calendar is full of cases for months ahead. How do we get in such a bind where we pass an act that just is full of holes? I mean, I, You know, I, I, to be quite honest, Jack, I think the judges are too technical in ruling a lot of statutes invalid when they're, when they're doing a social job and they should be a little more bending about those things and not just put words against words and say one, some words have to go Green without Tyler. considering the consequences, a little technicality. A little bit of the Nelson touch would go a long way. Yeah, that's right. And this poor guy here, that's we don't know the circumstances, but they sure. will be tragic regardless. He's now got to wait six months to get into the Supreme Court at somebody's vast expense to have the custody matter yeah, decided. I know. I don't know. You sometimes wonder if the whole system of justice is creaking to a standstill. Well, I don't, the United States takes a little broader view of something, eh, in terms of whether something is constitutional or not. They think a little bit about the social effects of the decision, and I think our judges should Is that too. a basic difference between uh, the interpretation of our Constitution and yes. the interpretation of theirs? Yeah, we pretend that we just look at it as legal words and decide it legalistically regardless of what's happening out in the community. And I think that's a mistake. Thank you. All we can give this chap is sympathy. From Lanceville. Go ahead from Lanceville. Go ahead from Lanceville. What are you? Oh, my mistake, Linda. My mistake, I took the long, wrong line. First mistake I've made this year. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Um, how, how is it yes. Yes. I'd, li I'd like to, to point out that it is... If a judge takes a job, like, I think his social life should be looked into. It, it is his responsibility, and he, he has taken a big responsibility, and if he doesn't look after his life properly, I, th I don't think he has to have an important job like that. How old are you, by the way? How old are you? 22. 22? Yes. You see, this is a... Now, she's expressed very well what you were telling me earlier. And it's also, she's expressed a little bit of what I've been saying, that our younger people mm -hmm. of today's generation are in many cases, Jack, a good deal better citizens than you and I had been. Not Go ahead, either. please. Uh, Mr. McDonald? Yes? It's a shame that you are sitting there with such an inept interviewer as Webster, because <laughs> your experience as a former attorney general, I am sure you would have taken some prompt action regarding the ambulance case when a man bled to death and nothing ever happened. No charges were laid. He's talking about the case in the hotel across from St. Paul's Hospital where the man phoned up to report a nosebleed, mm -hmm. and when they finally got around to answering the call, he was dead in his Correct, own Jack. Yeah. Now you've come, uh, Jack, 
You've come down hard on the judges. You've come down hard on everybody. But let you stay quiet. Let Mr. McDonald speak because he's had the experience that you haven't had. Okay, I'll keep my inept mouth shut, Mr. McDonald. You deal with this character. Well, I don't know the case in detail, but if you got the job of A.G., and of Jack, I'm sure, would do the, a good job as anybody, too, and I don't agree with that part of what you're saying, but uh, you'd make a great A.G. because you know no law, Jack, and that's part of the job description. You've got to act from a bit of heart and a bit of common sense. Too much knowledge of law is not so good, so you'd be all right. But no, you've really got to be vigilant to where something like that comes to your attention and then throw the resources of your justice system in that direction to make sure it's cleared up. You can't give him an answer to this question. Jack? The particular case? Mr. McDonald. Yes? Go on. Thank you, Jack. Thank Th you, Mr. McDonald. Thank you. Thank you for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Inept indeed. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Good morning. Yes. Uh, I'd like to ask Mr. McDonald what he thinks about judges belonging to fraternal organizations when they're sitting on the bench. Fraternal organizations. Fraternal organizations of any kind. What's your worry? Spell it out. Well, I think that uh, when fraternal organizations, when a member comes up before a judge that belongs to that same order, he gets more lenient treatment than a person mm. that does not belong. Oh, the kind of Mason thing. Well, or the Vancouver yes, Club thing. Well, the Vancouver Club, of course, but, is a but, real fraternal order. But look, the judges should uh, and uh, step aside when they know the person because they belong to the Kiwanis or something or they both belong to the Vancouver Club. He should not. There'd be another judge available to decide that man's case. That is a, that's the proper way to handle it, it I must, do believe. It must be done. And if it's in a small town, then maybe the case has to wait for a month while a judge comes from outside because... I think that's the answer for that. I really do. Yeah. Don't, don't restrict the social life of judges totally because they'll be eunuchs and they won't know what's going on out in the community. If they were, you're not so wouldn't have some of the problems. <laughs> you're, you're <laughs> I could not resist that crack, Alec McDonald. Well, I used the wrong word. You said Every, everybody did. makes a mistake. Go ahead, please. Yeah, good morning. Let's go. Good morning. Funny, how, you know, five years ago, ten years ago, I wouldn't have made such a crack. I think people are a little bit more sophisticated than they were. I hope. Yeah. Wait till you see the phone calls to switchboard. Go ahead, please. Yeah, Mr. McDonald. Yes. Please, can you tell me, as a member of the NDP, are you a social democrat or are you a democratic socialist? And well, you realize that there is a difference. No, it depends. Uh, everybody has a different definition for them. But I'm a democratic socialist. Uh, I don't think we're possibly going to pull this Western civilization together and get back to some of the Scottish virtues of thrift and hard work and save for a rainy day without sitting around a table and planning our affairs. <laughs> Alec, you're a hypocrite. I am just not. A moment, you don't just don't understand you what socialism's all about. You think it's the handout, the free lunch, and now you just haven't. You don't know what it's all about. What are these virtues you want again? Thrift, Thrift hard work, and save, save for Saving a rainy for day. A rainy Something. Day. Yes, that's right. Build up your investment capital. Modernize your industry. That's socialism. Heck, the guys who formed the socialist movement came from the dirty thirties. And they were not looking for welfare, they were looking for a job. They wanted to help their fellow citizens. That's what socialism's all about. Yeah, yeah. I'd, hate to, I'd love to see you in charge of the national pamphlets of the NDP. But a socialist is not very far away from the goals of the communists to build up socialism. No, I, do. I totally disagree with that. You know, the reason that, that Khrushchev is not going to bury us is what the democratic socialists are doing in Western Europe and in time will do in North America. They're building up a strong social democracies against which communism cannot make any progress. Yeah, but, but listen, Mr. Mr. McDonald, a socialist is not a democrat and has never been. Oh, they, well, we, we have a problem of a communication here, yeah, Mr. McDonald, because people from Eastern Europe, with all due respect to them and to you, the word socialism is to them the word communism. I know. And uh, I've tried to explain it myself on many occasions. I even tried to explain national socialist to Mr. Bennett one day, but he wouldn't quite <laughs> understand me, if you recall that reference. <laughs> but thank you for your call. Mr. McDonald, I'm sure, understands, and he's not anything yeah. other than a democratic socialist. That's right. Why should I be nice to you? Well, <laughs> you've... Alec, uh, uh, you're, still, you're, you're still kind of remembering that 
No, that's okay. All right, McDonald, uh, you better do it. Having let the press carry the heat and burden of the day, the press and the media will be watching closely to see if the NDP has done its homework on matters which should undoubtedly be raised in the House, forcibly and bluntly, at this session. Yeah, we should. You should, but will you? We have a public duty, and we will discharge it. Thank you very much, Alec. My next guest should be really quite fascinating. He's a former Canadian ambassador to Colombia and Ecuador, and his name is David Lawton, after Alec leaves with his smelly cigar. Thank you. A break. Minutes in the segment, Jack. Can you some coffee? Uh, oh, right, the thanks. Uh, Black with sugar. Black thanks. With sugar? Okay. I've got the latest wire service today. Nice to come out. You're the United States and the Western world is very much on tenterhooks about the state of the 50 and 40 odd hostages in Iran. But before I introduce my guest, let me read you the latest copy on the wire from Bogota, Colombia. The guerrillas holding the Dominican Republican's embassy in Bogota, Colombia, freed five more women hostages this morning, but continued to hold at least 40 other captives, 18 of them ambassadors, including Diego Asensio of the United States. Reporters watched as four automobiles, one of them riddled with bullet holes, drove the women to safety. One of those released was the Costa Rican ambassador, Elena Chassul Nonje, or Monje. The guerrillas now have freed all 15 women held in the embassy since it was seized in a blaze of gunfire Wednesday during a, during a Dominican Independence Day reception. Yesterday, 10 women and three wounded men and a teenage boy were released. The 29 armed members of the leftist organization called M19 say that they want, I think it's 50 million in, in compensation or in ransom money, and they're ready for a long siege. Lucky this morning to have David Lawton with me who just retired from external affairs on December the 28th of last year. And he was Canadian ambassador to Colombia and Ecuador. Not that long ago. How long ago, Mr. Lawton? Well, I left um, Bogota on the 18th of December, retired formally from the service on the 28th of December, as you've said. So uh, I've been there just over two months ago. <coughs> Had your retirement been delayed, it's conceivable, you might have been in the horrifying position of being one of the hostages inside that... Uh, building today? It's very probable because uh, most of us uh, uh, made a point of attending these National Day celebrations as a courtesy and I likely would have been there. <laughs> Tell me, can you give me some of the political flavor to help understand Bogota, Colombia? Because from what little I've read, and only in the papers in the last few days, it seems to have some kind of a liberal government. Yes, um, they have a um, democratic constitution. There are two major parties. And at this moment, the party in power is, is a liberal government, nominated, denominated as a liberal government. Uh, their cabinet uh, is uh, split between the two major parties, um, a slight majority in favor of the liberals. Um, it's, a, it's a democratic process, which is a, oh, sort of a combination of our parliamentary system and of the U.S. System. And it's really split down the middle, liberals and conservatives. Yes, with a liberal majority in the cabinet. Uh, On the face of it, is it a democratic country, too, in which to live? Oh, yes, yes. They have elections every four years and uh, uh, appoint a president by, that, by voting, by the voting system. Are, are living conditions bad in the country? Is it a country of rich and poor, or is there some reasonable standard of living for all? No, one of the major problems is uh, a great discrepancy between the levels of income. The rich are normally very well to do, and some of the poor are at the poverty level. However, this is not an easy problem. It's, uh, it's a beautiful country but um, one uh, with uh, very difficult terrain, high mountain ranges, low valleys, uh, the part that is over on the, uh, 
what they call the Llanos over on the Brazilian border is swampy, extremely hot. So it's a difficult area in which to provide social ser uh, services and, uh, and an equitable income distribution. Is it a country which has been coming up off its knees? I don't even know the resources of Bogota, mm -hmm. what it lives on. Well, it, of Colombia, rather. Um, it has uh, certainly been developing. It's a country of uh, just over 25 million people. The major source of foreign income is still coffee, uh, about 60% of the, of the uh, earnings each year, but it's a major producer of um, minerals, uh, gold, silver, emeralds, and uh, uh, it has a strong agricultural base. They are about to develop coal. They have some uranium sources. So it's a very, it's a resource-rich country which is moving ahead continually, but it is still an underdeveloped country. Now maybe you can give me some kind of understanding. I read a piece in the province this morning about young intellectuals seek collapse of Colombia's privileged society, and they're called M19. And they apparently are now taking the credit or the blame for this incredible thing at the, was it the Dominican Embassy? I, that. I believe so, right. right. Can you tell me about them? Well, Colombia has a history of um, violence within their political system. Uh, after a period when there was almost a civil war between the two major parties, they formed what they called a Frente Nacional, or sort of a national coalition. This satisfied the political ambitions of a great majority of the country, but there were the radicals on the outside who wanted uh, a stronger voice and who wanted to see some changes made immediately in terms of distribution of um, redistribution of wealth and uh, social amenities, etc. So, uh, despite the fact that the uh, that there is uh, uh, a political peace uh, from the point of view of violence between the two major parties, there have always been uh, a large number of radicals who are wanting to impose their views upon whatever government was in power. And the M19 is one of about five, but by far the, the strongest group. <coughs> How would you compare it? I mean, to what body? We've, we've never heard of M19 before. Uh, there was a dictator there at one time, it says here, Gustavo Rojas Penilla. That's right. That was in the, in the early 1950s. Um, after uh, about 20 years of this constant quasi-civil war, they finally put in a dictator because there was so much bloodshed and they had to find some way to get out of their problems. Eventually he was deposed and this, uh, uh, what they call this coalition, national coalition, was formed. But it was right to, to bring the country out of its political stalemate and... Uh, but when they did uh, that, they created perhaps more strength for... Would you compare the M19 to the Red Brigade in Italy? Yes. Yes, I, I'm not terribly familiar with that no. group, but I think that's right. They, uh, they are attempting to impose their aims and ambitions by violence and uh, are prepared to go to great lengths so to maintain. You might call them an anarchist group to a certain extent. Yes, I, I suppose so, although uh, to my mind those sort of groups have their own platform and they are prepared to establish a government. I've never seen a manifesto of the M19. Uh, they no. seem to be uh, content to insist that certain measures be taken by whatever government is, power, is in power rather than looking for power themselves. One of the demands just now is to, to release, I think they call, it, they call them political prisoners, about 300. Is, uh, is Colombia known for whipping people into jail without trials for, as political prisoners? Uh, not particularly. Um, I'm surprised at the number. I think there was 150 or 200 who who uh, the guerrilla groups call political prisoners, <coughs> but the government would call criminals of one sort or another, those who have broken the law. Uh, the reason for the high number at this moment is that about a year ago, yes, a year ago last December, the M19, who are an audacious and, and uh, cunning group, broke into an armory, stole something like 5,000 weapons, grenades, rifles, machine guns, and so forth. Mm. And uh, with this sort of an arsenal became a, a threat to the government, a real threat. As a consequence, the, the army who has responsibility for national security um, took strong measures and they were fortunate in that they discovered some papers and identified something over 200 people who were supporters to some degree or another of the M19. This allowed them to make uh, mass arrests and uh, uh, there have been trials going on all of this last year. Uh, the government has been criticized for the trials because um, they are really court-martials, and it's not open to the public, which mm -hmm. has been one of the 
Well, the complaint. country isn't under martial law as such. No, 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 not under martial law. There is a what they call an Emergency Measures Act, uh, which again has been criticized, um, which allows uh, the military forces, uh, in the name of national security, to uh, uh, to arrest persons and hold them for ten days, um, and uh, to actually search private dwellings without a warrant. But after that, uh, if they are <coughs> accused of national security charges, they go before court martial, and other than that, they go before a criminal court or they're released. Yeah. And what about this aspect, which is well, beginning to make more sense now? Young intellectuals from privileged classes. Is that why they're so efficient? Are they young intellectuals who are just disgusted with the way their fathers and forefathers have, perhaps in their view, bled the country? I think it's possible that some of the leaders <coughs> are of that group, but of course there's not too much, too much known, and what is known is not always uh, available. But um, my impression is that uh, uh, the M19 as a group consists of a, of a sort of a strata of the society. The leaders are probably from the privileged group, and don't forget the university is free in Colombia. Anybody that can meet the educational qualifications can go, so a lot of people that are not from the wealthy or elite society still get to university. Good education. Hold your breath, please, uh, <laughs> Mr. Lawton. Really quite fascinating. How often do we look above this way or that way or that way or that way? We t tend to be parochial after the break. How long were you... You, you were uh, speaking to Mr. Lawton, who was ambassador formerly until very recently to Colombia and Ecuador. Mm -hmm. How did you handle that? Are they side by side? Yes. Uh, Ecuador is immediately to the south of Colombia. Uh, by air it's about an hour and ten minute trip. By road, unfortunately, about three days because the roads are rather poor shape and they wind through the mountains. Um, we, had a, we have a staff of 12 Canadians down there. We're responsible um, for not only the political and consular relationships, mm -hmm. but also for trade. So when I say we had a, someone there uh, at least one week a month, it might be um, one time it would be an immigration official, another mm -hmm. time a trade official. Uh, sometimes I would go myself for discussions with the government, etc. Uh, you, you must know Diego, how does one pronounce his name? Diego Asensio. Asensio, you must know him. Oh yes, I know him very well. Uh, He's a U.S. ambassador, I should add, who's probably the principal hostage of all those held in this place. I would think so. Yes, um, we were neighbors and in a relatively small foreign colony. Uh, there are about 47 diplomatic missions there. We saw each other frequently at events such, such as, as this. this. And uh, also uh, socially, there's an American club and uh, a Canadian club and uh, we interchanged. Uh, a very close contact so right. socially between the Americans and the Canadians, I suppose. That's right. Many Tell me what's going to happen. What do you think? What do you think w is likely to happen? The $50 million demand? Uh, and they have done assassinations and kidnappings on quite a scale before, have they not? That's right. They assassinated someone a couple of years ago. Uh, Mercado. Right, yes. yes. Uh, that's true. That is true. Yeah. What do you think can happen now? Or is it just going to be another long, drawn-out, agonizing interchange of so-called communications? Well, I think it, it's very, very difficult to predict at this moment. On the negative side, you have a strong and determined group who must be very much buoyed up by their success. They've got uh, international publicity. They have done what they set out to do. They've embarrassed the government, and they have in their hands a great lever. Um, they, uh, they have shown to be, um, to be capable of uh, taking drastic steps in, t in order to achieve their aims, and so uh, it could be. A Are they situation. people of a volatile temperament? Said he to ask a silly question, but it might help to understand it. Well, this is true, and I think this is probably one of the greatest dangers at this moment. Uh, you have a, as we've mentioned, we have a, a fairly sound government there. Uh, they are they're in control of the local situation, as far as we know, and they have set up a good negotiating team. This man Carrasco, who is responsible, is a former foreign minister, a former ambassador to London. Oh, he's he's a Colombian. He's a Colombian. They, I don't know the second man, but apparently there's a two-man negotiating team. And as long as they're talking um, and are prepared to make some sorts of concessions, I think uh, uh, maybe over a period of time it can be diffused. But on the other hand, you're quite right in pointing out that the Latin temperament is a little bit volatile. You have heavily armed people. Uh, 
opposed to each other, both in the political sense and in the confrontation sense. Uh, you have increasingly difficult conditions, obviously, in this embassy. It's not a very big building. It's crowded with people. There must be a problem with food, with water, with sanitation. So you have the sort of things that can build up nervous tensions. Just a kind of good-sized house, is it? That's right. It's uh, four or five bedrooms, a little bit more space downstairs than normally, but uh, nothing more than that. And I suppose they, there must still be 60 or 70 people crowded into this. So you probably know a hell of a, lot, a great number of the people. Oh, yes, I do. Any I, other ambassadors you know offhand? Oh, yes. Um, I would say I, I've just read the reports. I have no information uh, from other sources than that, but uh, uh, I suppose I'm on a first-name basis with 10 of the 16 or so. There was a very funny report, I think it was in the Y service this morning or yesterday, that the Russian official, the Russian ambassador, was handed out envelopes to East European ambassadors, and they stayed very briefly at the function oh. and left early. Did you see that report? No, I didn't see that. That's news. Perhaps well, I was... Perhaps their intelligence was better. It might have been. Um, they, <coughs> yes, they, they normally go, not to the same extent as other missions do to the smaller Caribbean and Central American countries, but uh, their ambassador Romanov is normally at these functions, and I was surprised that there were not some East Europeans. Uh, well, that's what the story the said. Do, do they wield a big influence? Uh, do the East Bloc nations wield a big influence in South America? In well, Boca Colombia? Not so much uh, in Colombia. They are present, uh, but they, are, they haven't been actively associated with any of the guerrilla groups. They are trying in their own way through economic development and uh, other manners to influence the, uh, the, the government and, uh, and the actions that they take. They have a strong economic aid program operating in Colombia. They have a rather, lar rather large mission, I think second only to the U.S. Uh, but um, uh, I wouldn't say that they have a high profile in terms of political determination. Is the United States as such, uh, as it might be in some other countries, kind of reviled by the guerrilla groups? Are they, if they were to choose a foreign target, would they choose the United States, I suppose, as the foreign target? Very likely. Very likely. Very yes. likely. Mm -hmm. One thing I don't understand is that uh, the aims of M19 are, are allegedly be that they don't aspire to total power. This is what somebody wrote overnight. But they want change and they say violence is the only way we're going to get change. I think that's right. The, um, <coughs> they don't, uh, no one knows for sure how many supporters they have, but obviously not enough to, to staff a government, uh, to put in a cabinet or to operate the principal agencies, and I think they must be well aware of that, so that their only alternative, if they are to achieve their overall aims, is to get the government to do it through forms of pressure. Is this kind of action liable to create sympathy for the guerrillas in Bogota and thereabouts? Are, uh, are, they, uh, are the local Colombians uh, that politically unhappy that they would flock to a standard led by M19? Well, I think it will have an influence on their prestige. Uh, I don't uh, think that too many people will flock to them, but they will, they will ha now have um, uh, a reinforced um, uh, sort of uh, standing. standing within the populace, which will be helpful to them, and which, which is no doubt one of the reasons why they did it, because they suffered badly, their image as being a, a force within the country suffered badly when they were mauled by the by the uh, security Army. forces after they... Uh, after the big theft of the 5,000 rifles. That's right. Listen, yeah. so a penny drops, finally. Bolivar, uh, Simon Bolivar was the great... Was this one of the first South American countries to really to get off its knees to have kind of, uh, some mm -hmm. kind of freedom? Oh, yes. Yes, it is. It's, uh, and they cherish it uh, very strongly. Simon Bolivar. He was one of the ones that freed the country, that's right. Uh, and uh, he's still the, sort of the national hero. There's a mu various museums to him, to him, although he's now buried in Venezuela, actually, he died in Colombia on the coast. <coughs> well, you have one blessing to count, really, haven't you? <laughs> yes, you I weren't have. there when it happened. That's true, although uh, when you see uh, and know what sort of problems all so many of your friends are, it doesn't give you that much comfort. Oh, no, it doesn't give you that much comfort, but no. uh, I don't know. I haven't got the details of what happened to, to your successor, but he's not in the embassy. I have no information either. I'm sort of off the, the network now. Um, Normally, we would have been represented there by our charge affairs, uh, Paul Donahue. Uh, I heard one report, um, not personally, but was passed on to me, that um, he was on his way there and then heard that there was uh, an incident and uh, turned back. And I hope that's true. But, uh, Did you have a bodyguard down there? 
No, uh, we have a 24-hour guard on the residents, and we have uh, a policeman in our offices from 9 till 5. But uh, the Americans and the British and many others do have, they have bodyguards in their cars and they have uh, guard cars following them. But we didn't feel that our profile was that high or that we were uh, so much of a target that this was uh, necessary. Mm -hmm. You may have been overconfident. It might have been. Yeah. Sit there till the end of the program with me. Just got a few minutes to go. I'll take phone calls or whatever between now and 10, 30, and Mr. Lawton will be with me after the break. No. We're rolling. Okay, this is an audio tape bridge. I promised everybody a laugh this morning, and you're going to get a laugh now because I'm going to close the show. Did off he pay his union camera. dues? Catch him quick. Yeah. What's on tomorrow, Linda? Tomorrow we. How many countries did you serve in, Mr. Lawton? Um, I know you were in Seattle. Mm -hmm. I had two postings in the United States, um, one in Venezuela, in Mexico, Trinidad, uh, London. <laughs> <laughs> You've been around. So, uh, Go ahead, please. Hello. Nobody there, Linda. They've gone. Go ahead, please. Yes, I'd like to ask a question of Ambassador Lockwood. Yes, please. Well, Lawton, L-A-U-G-H-T-O-N, just for the record. Go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, in the Roman times, I understand that, uh, well, diplomats and ambassadors were really basically hostages to ensure good behavior on the part of their respective governments until uh, the English system around the 16th and 17th century when uh, they received diplomatic immunity. Uh, in light of recent events in uh, Iran and uh, the assassination of the American ambassador in Afghanistan, do you see uh, a return of the old thoughts that uh, diplomats will again become hostages uh, to, re you know, to ensure uh, the behavior of uh, their government? I was just wondering if, uh, if this sort of thing, if we could regress back to that, uh, that, sort, of th that sort of thinking. Well, frankly, I wasn't aware that uh, that was the, the beginnings of the system. Um, I think, uh, rather to the contrary, that uh, uh, it's important to keep those diplomatic channels open because so many misunderstandings that uh, are needless and can lead to problems <coughs> will arise when there's not a channel of communication. And uh, um, I think that uh, more and more countries are realizing that uh, it's important to them to have some means of communication rather than just a hotline, some uh, system by which there can be a continuing dialogue. So I would hope that this would continue uh, and not go back to the hostage and confrontation situation. Yeah, I very, I very, I vaguely remember the point you made, and really that's what's happening today in some ways. But how can diplomacy survive if you have the arbitrary kidnap and capture, sometimes with the approval of, or the apparent approval of the government, and sometimes with this? How can diplomats well, sleep any place, any night, in any part of the world with any safety other than in the major nations? Well, the diplomatic conventions which exist between most countries require the host country to provide adequate protection for the ambassador and for the staff of, uh, of the governments to, uh, which are accredited to them. So it is really the responsibility of the, in this case, the Colombian government to ensure the safety and security of, uh, of the diplomats which are held hostage. Now, the only case that I remember recently where the government in power has refused to step in and protect uh, the diplomatic emissaries uh, uh, is the case in Iran. And I would hope it wouldn't deteriorate any further because we will then block that channel. <coughs> really quite sad. Thank you very much. From Victoria. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yes? That's you, ma'am. Speak up. Yes. Hello, Jack. Hello. Um, Have you got a question? Just hold on for a minute while I put a question I don't want to miss with uh, uh, Ambassador Lawton. Drugs. Is Colombia not one of the principal, is the right word, exporter of drugs to North America? Uh, Colombia is the source. Um, of uh, 
a great quantity of drugs which come from South America. Some of them are produced within Colombia. A number of them flow from uh, Peru, Ecuador, Bolivia, down through the land routes down to Colombia and then are exported to various parts of the world. It's right, um, uh, drug, the drug trade, despite the, uh, the disapproval of the government, is still a, a multi-million dollar industry. <coughs> Without which the country, uh, the individuals in the country might be in financial trouble, more of them. Well, most of the money that comes from drugs doesn't get into legitimate channels. Uh, its major problem right now to the government is that it's a source of, of rabid inflation. I suppose so. Inflation, but sir, your presence this morning has been really informative, educational, and illuminating. My thanks to David Lawton, the former Canadian ambassador to Colombia and Ecuador. I'll be back after the break. Listen, mm. that way. Uh, One minute. I don't suppose we can plug gas, Cyril Shelford's roast. Oh, yes, we can. When okay. is it? Tomorrow night, March 1st, 8 p.m., the Lake Elts. Lake Elts. Lake Elts. Lake Elts. Yeah. Hotel. I'll do that off the top. Yeah. Lake Elts Hotel and Terrace. Yeah. yeah what is this? A retirement roast? Um, is he in the house or not? No, I don't think he is. He didn't run last time. You sure? I'm sure. It's just, it's just 30 seconds his now. friends from, from both sides of government are getting together to roast him. Memo to my old friend Cyril Shelford. Won't be at the hotel in person tomorrow night, La Kels Hotel and Terrace, for your roast from all kinds and assorted friends of yours from all quarters. My voice will be there. Listen carefully, Cyril Shelford. That's tomorrow night, La Kels Hotel. Quickly. John Bullock, Federation of Independent Business Presidents. And we're keeping a close eye on HLRA and the nurses, the big yeah. story at the moment. 9 p.m. Monday precisely. I promised everybody a laugh this morning, and you're going to get the laugh now because I'm going to close the show. Did off he pay his camera. union dues? Catch him quick. Yeah. What's on tomorrow, Linda? Tomorrow we have representatives from the Registered Nurses Association of BC. Their strike vote comes out today, so we'll find out a little bit more about it tomorrow. So tomorrow morning. At 9 a.m. precisely, Jack uh, um, Webb, Webb, Webster, 9 a.m. precisely, the nurses, their strike vote today, 9 a.m. precisely tomorrow. Jack? I told them to finish with 9 a.m. precisely. How long to go? 15, 15, 15. <laughs> Keep talking, Linda. You gotta fill it till the end. This is your show. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, out.